Good evening and welcome to the shop here in beautiful, dark downtown Canterbury. It's a beautiful cold day here in Canterbury. It's, down, it's like winter has stormed on us again. I was out plowing the yard today. Oh, the joys of winter. Thank but you. <laughs> we're glad that you're here with us and we're inside. We've got the uh, heat up and it's nice and cozy. Mm -hmm. And tonight we've got a treat for you. I'm going to answer the question that I've been asked many times from uh, mostly younger woodworkers, but really it's a curiosity, I think, of all of us, is how can I get an apprentice experience in this world today? And it's not like the old days when you could actually apprentice with someone. You just don't see those opportunities. And I want to get into that and share with you the amazing ways we can actually find apprenticeship opportunities way more than you might think. <laughs> so, hey, if you enjoy this content, I hope you'll consider subscribing, share and like, and also check out our website at epicwoodworking.com. We have lots of opportunities there for you to take some courses and apprentice with us. Yes. And as we continue in a lifelong kind of apprenticeship ourselves. That's right. Uh, so we also have one course, I think, that still has some openings. We have some in-shop courses up there for this summer. Unfortunately, most all are sold out, but we have some spaces in the veneering course. So check those out. Yes, there's two veneering classes in the earlier part of the summer. A few yes. spaces left. So. And we've got a new course coming up this Tuesday night that I've been working hard finalizing these drawings. And it's going to be on a table similar to this, a <laughs> pedestal table. <laughs> it's going to take us about a day to make it. You're going to have to get some little chairs. But hey. All right. no, it's called a round pedestal table. It's a Tuesday. Uh, Tuesdays at 8. Yes, and it's actually full sessions. size. Online there's any course. confusion. You don't have to be here. That's right. Online. <laughs> All of that at epicwoodworking.com. Yes. All right. So let's get started. The wonderful world of apprenticeship. If you saw the email or my Instagram post today, actually, it's going to be on the thumbnail of the YouTube video as well. Is that already posted? Do you post the thumbnail already? The thumbnail is on there, Oh, but they, so they can't see it now because it's... But they will see it. It's you, yes. All right. Well, that was just a photograph of my mentor, my beloved mentor, Pug Moore. It was actually this photograph. I just took a photo of this one. Here, I'll come show it. Oh, you're going to show it? All right. I just like... That's a great reminder to me of the best times I had learning woodworking. You know, this... Uh, that photo was taken in uh, May, June, 92, there in Pug Shop. Mm -hmm. And there's his tool cabinet behind him. And that was his favorite shirt. He loved that <laughs> red shirt. <laughs> he never told me that. I just knew it from seeing <laughs> how much he wore it. He loved he that loved comfortable that. shirt. Yeah, he sure loved you. That's so for sure. we all have our go-to shirts when we're trying to get comfortable. <laughs> so... Anyway, my experience with Pug was pretty unique. Uh, it was really a, a godsend of an experience. I was looking to get to learn a lot about woodworking, and we had made a trip down to North Carolina, and I was all in to go for it. And I had looked at some schools like North Bennett, um, really primarily North Bennett, and, and you know, just going back and paying almost like for college degree to add two years of that I was like ah, oh, maybe there's another way so this turned out to me my other way it was amazing that um, through a series of of connections through friends we found this mm. I landed in this shop I won't go into all the details about it but I spent about three years there with Pug in his shop and we made primarily 18th century reproductions he was at the tail end of his career. He was in his 70s when we started working together and um, had a blast, made a lot of nice 
piece of furniture. I should, should have posted more with that. I also posted that photo on Instagram at Tom McLaughlin 10. All right. Yeah, let me just add this before you go on. Uh, if you're curious about that story, a little bit more detail, you can find all of that at our About page. There's a timeline and a whole story of how that did come to Oh, to thank you. Yeah, so. that's right. You can read more about it on epicwoodworking.com. Check it out. All right. So a lot of times people say, hey, um, I'm trying to learn woodworking and I'm getting started. And they're basically me when I was trying to mm. get into Pug's world, <laughs> you know, and they kind of like suggesting like, maybe uh, could I learn from you somehow? And it's, it's odd. It's an odd kind of spot to be put in because, you know, I want to help them naturally, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I don't, I don't want to hire anybody. And that's exactly what Pug said. I don't want to hire anybody. And um, so we ended up having a different arrangement. But I'm going to talk to you more about the actual apprenticeship opportunity, what, like the thing that's closest to an apprenticeship, if you wanted to get in a job with a maker um, toward the end. I first want to begin talking about the unbelievable opportunities to apprenticeship in so many other ways. And I'm just going to tick through a few of them. But you know, I have learned so much from you mm. all. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're, you're sitting in, in areas of the country that are probably rich with mm -hmm. experiences mm -hmm. and, and creativity and great... Um, masterworks and resources. Yeah. So please, let's let this forum, let's let the chat mm -hmm. be a rich kind of contribution for where we found have been really excellent apprentice opportunities. It's not all me. I know I have, like I said, I, I learned so much from just seeing you all. And, and to add to that, we've talked a lot about this in just a, a couple months. We're going on a road trip. And we're going to stop in and visit with a number of woodworking guilds. And we're really excited to be doing that. And that's obviously a great way to learn. I'll say a little more about that in a bit. Mm -hmm. But one of the prime ways is just looking at good woodworking magazines. This was a, a real basis for uh, myself and a lot of us, when there wasn't a lot, there was no internet, you know, in the 90s. The, I mean, there was still hardline phones. I mean, everything has changed so much. You would never think of taking a photo with a phone. You had a camera. <laughs> Remember that? You had uh, crazy stuff. To think of videotaping live, is it, it's not even taping. It's digital <laughs> live is mind boggling, you know? So, but we've had fine woodworking, we still have fine woodworking, and there was a big stack of them in Pug's shop, and I devoured those, and he ended up giving me all his fine woodworking, mm. and then I kept on getting it, so I've got a bunch of them. But this is the most recent issue, and it just reminded me of how, how rich this has been mm. in contributing to my own understanding of woodworking and joy of it, and all the variety of techniques. This, this is really a great one, too, because just yesterday, Chris Bexford posted on his Instagram this magazine cover, which, and that's him, you know? So he posted, I'm like, oh, he's posting a picture of that. I wonder what he's going to say. And he said something uh, in gratitude that this is actually his 85th article. Wow. He's written for Fine Woodworking Magazine, 85. Wow. And this is his, the 12th time he's been on the cover. Amazing. So I'm like, whoa. So I just wrote to him, I said, wow, uh, that's amazing, <laughs> Chris. I said, you are the Tom Brady of the Fine Woodworking <laughs> League. <laughs> he really awesome. is. I mean, he set like the bar so high. Who's going to touch that, right? And I was really flattered. I went, I looked to see if he saw my comment because we we're we're sort of friends. I mean, we we he was on the classic woodworking show, and we know each other to talk. 
But he did comment and he said, thanks, Tom. And you're the Larry Bird. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I am, but that was very nice of him to say. <laughs> I love Larry Bird. He yes. couldn't have picked anyone higher in my world. Oh, um, but anyway, what a great magazine um, for just all kinds of project ideas. This is a nice basic project with a hanging shaker um, shelf. And I, Pug and I, we did some classic kind of 18th century hanging shelves. I, I saw this and I went, whoa, maybe that's a possible project. I don't know if hanging shelves are as big a thing. You know, are you interested in a hanging shelf project? I mean, do people do that anymore? I don't see them on the walls like I used to, you know, those kind of shelves where you'd put knickknacks and plates. Maybe, maybe I'm just missing it. I just assume it's not a thing. But anyway, this is just a great magazine. I won't go into the whole thing, but there's Chris's article. Uh, man, articles about bandsaw, router tables, uh, designs for nice beginner level. I mean, there's a lot of nice beginner level projects in here. And then there's advanced things and inspirational things toward the back. The earlier issues are get really deep. So if you want some crazy stuff. Got, I didn't notice it, but you got a little hair activity in the back popping up. That's what Sarah was talking about. I didn't catch that, Jack. Sarah? Sarah said she liked your hair. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I am it, just it was, so uh, happy that's to good. know Thank my you, Sarah, hair Thank you, Sarah, for pointing right. that out. Is it I, right now? It's good now. Oh, it, it had an alfalfa appeal to it. <laughs> I, how I was missing it, it's kind of in front of the tool cabinet. That's All right. Thanks, Sarah. Just call me Alfalfa. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Still love you. Um, so magazines, that's one way we can apprentice. Another great way, and I've talked about this on a number of times, so I'm not going to go all the way into it. Just great books. There are amazing books out there that are super resources. And it seems old-fashioned in a way because so much is available online. But there's something so nice about having a book and having it on your shelf and being able to go to it. And, you know, I use these as references all the time. This was one of Pug's favorites, the Joseph Downs book. We put links to all these in the notes. And mm -hmm. if you want to buy them, um, if you use those links, I, I, we forget to ever mention this. There is a little bit of an affiliate thing for us, but honestly, uh, it's not much, but... It doesn't cost you anymore, and it helps us a little bit. So you can check that book out if you're interested in that. But this is an awesome book on Queen Anne furniture in the Chippendale period. We did a lot with this. This is not Pug's issue. I have that, actually, on my bookcase. Um, his is really worn and taped on the binder. It has all kinds of great notes inside. This is another one uh, by Charles Montgomery from Winnetor. The, uh, that's also a winner toward Joseph Downs and all kinds of federal period. So the period just after the Chippendale period, we have a lot of federal furniture. And look, what's great about these is usually the photos are excellent. And you also have a lot of information about how it was constructed, the dimensions, um, like tables like this here. Sometimes you get underneath shots, but you get really beautiful photos. And some of the photos have been so excellent. Like even tables like this, I've done scale drawings and gotten pretty darn close knowing they're a uh, um, larger dimension here. I've gotten very close to the final appearance when I've copied them. I've done a table very similar to this one actually. Uh, so anyway, Wonderful resources where you can get idea of scale and proportion of great pieces in history. So, you know, in that sense, we're learning from the masters of generations past. We're just in the lineage, right? Even if you're a hobbyist, you are in the lineage mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. being potential master crafts. And it doesn't matter if you're a master or whatever. We're just all kind of in the mix of contributing to great American furniture. So here's another one, speaking of great American furniture, uh, by Lester Margon. And this one, 
differs in these. These are more like reference, almost like walking through a museum. This is similar in that, but it, Lester Margon went in and he made detailed measurements. He took detailed measurements of all like these pieces that are photographed. So you have the description and then you have the dimensions right down to all the thicknesses of everything. So much different. So if you can get the dimensions like of a table I showed you in that other book, if you can find a, a piece like that in here, let's say, I don't even know if there is one, but then you, then you start to see this, the dimensions of the various elements and like so the legs or whatever the dimensions are, you can then uh, kind of, what's the right word? Yeah, uh, the Scale. inductive, inductively <laughs> know what the dimensions are here, mm -hmm. okay? So there you go. And then there's other measure drawings. Here's one for Shaker by John Shea. And then this one on Shaker by, uh, this is a great one for Shaker by John Casse. These, all these are in the links, so you can look at it after. And uh, check those out if you're interested in more resources like books like that. Now, I mentioned museum collections. That's the other thing you can do. You can plan some time and visit museums and get up close and look at the amazing furniture in the collections. That's a blast. I, it's quiet, you know, you'll, you can go and look at the art. I mean, I've gone and looked at art. I like all kinds of art, but I don't understand art, oil paintings, like I know furniture. So it feels different and it's kind of cool to see what makes the grade for the masterworks that you would find in a museum. So you can travel to a museum like that. Um, check this out. This is, this is one time I got to travel to a museum. Some of you heard me mention this experience. I don't know if I've shown the photos on this, but, uh, but I got to, here we go. Wanna, can we, tell me where I'm not glaring oh, on so you. Pretty. How's that? Are we glaring? Yeah, just hold still. Should I go like this? No, nope, it's good. You like just, this. Which, what do you want me to right, do? Just okay. hold it. Yep. That's good. You got it. Okay. So this, this is a classic, uh, bureau or chest of drawers by John Townsend, 1765. I, this is one of really my favorite overall uh, chest of drawers. And um, I actually had a, a client commission me to make this. So I had this amazing opportunity to go down to the MMA, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City and measure this thing. Uh, there, there I am. Look at, look at actually measuring, photographing the very same one. And it was such a, a, an honor. I mean, I was there for three and a half hours. And they were very kind to say, yeah, I could come in on this day. So now, cool. I, I had a connection, so I don't know if they allow that anymore. And there's my photograph of the inside the top drawer, made by John Townsend, Rhode Island, 1765 in Newport, Rhode Island. And some of you are big fans of his. Um, I know, just, just like me. And uh, there's the one I ended up making. So this is the final, there's my torn backdrop. I need to <laughs> drop it out of that. There's always gotta be something, right? <laughs> but I learned a lot okay. from, from seeing that up close getting inside, it was like I was studying or apprenticing for that little bit of time with John Townsend. I mean, when you get up close and get to look inside and feel and see all everything, and then I could actually see the, the, the choices he made about the materials for the different elements. It was very instructive and confirming of a lot of things I learned with Pug and had experimented with other pieces. I'm still here. Um, okay. <laughs> But I just wanted to say, you don't have to go to museums like that. You don't actually have to go because museums have now made their collections available online like never before. You can go on the MMA website and we do put a link for that. Mm -hmm. And 
And these are photos of that chest. So if you looked up that John Towns and you found that chest, you're gonna see this series of photos. You can zoom in on these. The resolution is so amazing. Like you can, I don't know if this one's that quality, but I mean, you can see the saw cuts and the notches for the locks. And that was a mistake or something. And they were reusing that because that, that has nothing to do with that lock being there. Um, but you're looking up in here. You're getting the, as good a view as I got when I was right there. There's the bottom upside down. You can see everything about the blocks. And then the front view, another black and white, a close-up of the shell wow. itself. So that gives you the opportunity to proportion that. You know, you know that that, I believe that was 10 and 7 eighths side to side. And then you have the back. Uh, with these old chalks still on it. So that is available to look at. And something I just discovered that they, a uh, new policy they put in place in 2017. So I did this, oh man, this was probably early, around 2010 maybe, 12. Mm -hmm. um, so this new policy was not in place. It's called open access. And they have made all the public domain pieces like this, photographs are available to use for even commercial purposes. So you can, you can download everyone you see, OA at the bottom um, corner. They explain more about that and I give you links there. So you can, you can go right in as if you're going into the museum, look at the furniture collection, study from the great masters up close download the photos, post them to your Instagram, whatever it is. Um, tell people you made them. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, but you can, you can access it like never before. So check that out. Now, the Metropolitan Museum of Art is not the only museum. I have found this with other museums. I think the Athenium, is that right? The one, I think it's in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Do I get that right? I, I looked at their collection about six months ago as well. Um, someone, gosh, uh, Rich, a, a number of people have sent me uh, links to this John Townsend book, which the MMA has also made available for you to download. And it's all about John Townsend. So instead of spending, I think it's about $85 to buy it online, you can just download and go right through it. Zoom in on the photos. It's an amazing resource that I love that the museums are being more open so that we can benefit more from what they have there. And you don't have to necessarily travel to New York City. So if you know a museum or opportunity in your area that people might enjoy getting a close in view and you know the access, that it ha they have good access online, Please share that in the comments. We'd love to hear more about that. Tom, as can well. you? Um, Ken's curious what the primary and secondary material was on that. Oh, that's uh, that's Cuban mahogany. That was wow. San Domingan mahogany. Um, on the chest that I built, it was South American, um, but it was well. You saw the the color and it was extremely dense. It was as close as it could be to Cuban. So you can get very dense, um, genuine Honduran mahogany or South American. They're both. And then the, the secondary as well or secondary. Oh, well. the secondary. Um, they use a combination. I know there was some pine in there and poplar, but you know what? I have to actually look back to see what they did. My, I use poplar for my drawer sides and, uh, I may have used some white pine for the back, but uh, those were commonly used as secondary woods around here. But it got me off on a tangent, so thanks for sending me <laughs> that. Uh, but Mark, you and Rich both sent me that link. Um, I think it was in the forum. Did somebody post it there? Yeah, Rich in did the, there, and then Mark the forum. sent me it in an um, email. Um, but in that article or the book, 
the introduction in the forward, they talked about this book. So, of course, I had to go online and check it out, <laughs> and I got it. It was about an exhibit they had in the mid-50s in Newport, and these are all the pieces they had in there. Really great. You know, these books are so instructive. If you read the introduction, and then uh, it gives a nice background about what, what the world was like then and what it was like to be a cabinet maker and the cabinet makers specifically in Newport, Rhode Island. So it goes into some depth about them. Did you give me a link for that? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. I, you know what? This you can find out if you go on the John Townsend early on. It's not the greatest book, though, for photos. So I wouldn't recommend it necessarily. They're just... These photos are like secondary and they're not, they're not great. So you're going to find better images in other books. You're going to see better images in the downloadable John Townsend book. So there's some great opportunities with just books like that. Are there any other um, questions at the moment? Yes. I have a question about uh, are there any other books besides uh, the Margon book that are, that are offering measured drawings? Oh, yeah. Um, Oh, gosh, what's the guy's name? Actually, I put a link to one. Um, Godshell. Gotch, yeah, Godshell. Um, you know. What Masterpieces. Is it? Yeah, Masterpieces of Furniture. I put, I put that one in there. Um, I don't think I have the Lester Margon Making book Furniture in there. Masterpieces, I think it's called. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's a, a lot of them. Um, but Lester Margon is known quite a bit. But check out that one we have the link for. Making making furniture making masterpiece? furniture masterpieces. I think, I think it's, is called, what it's called. I think it's called furniture masterpieces or something. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, check that out. That's so the links are there if you want to look at them. Um, but just look up masterpieces of furniture, and you'll get a good listing. And some you'll see. And then also look for measured drawings. Search measured drawings of masterpieces of furniture <laughs> or whatever. Um, this, this is basically measured drawings of Shaker furniture, the Cassé book, and the Shea book is other also. But, so those are really helpful to get you launched in that way. All right, another great apprenticeship way is with your local guilds. Mm -hmm. They're, mm -hmm. like, we're going to visit the guilds. Guilds are, like, really big now, so you can't, you're not necessarily hanging out with a master craftsman, but you're hanging out with a lot of other people who are passionate about woodworking and sharing what you're making. There's usually show and tells. They're bringing in good speakers or um, people to come in and share their story. All kinds of demonstrations, specialty groups if you're into luthiers or wood turning or you're into period furniture or you're just beginning. Yeah. So there's something for everyone, a lot of these groups. So search those local groups and um, a lot of them are reopening after COVID. They're getting back into, you know, they were doing virtual meetings. And so, yeah, um, it's a great time to get back in. If you feel like maybe you weren't, it's hard to break into something. There's a lot of new right. and experiences. Be and, um, and, and because of COVID, all these groups got used to Zooming. So mm -hmm. in the last group that I, when I visited Albany, hey, you guys, <laughs> I, uh, had a great time presenting to those who were in the room, but they were also Zooming it. So yeah. a number of their members were watching on Zoom. So you cool. probably don't even have to be local to experience this. But I wanted to say, in a lot of these guilds, you have, you have hobbyists or beginners. You have all levels. And quite often, you're going to have a percentage of professionals. So I remember in, the, in New Hampshire Furniture Master, it's not, no, the New what is it? The Guild of New Hampshire Woodworkers. <laughs> They're a very strong group here in New Hampshire. You got to check them out. Um, GN. Oh my gosh. It's GNHW.org, I believe. That doesn't sound right. Guild of New Hampshire Woodworkers. Oh, it is? Okay. Sorry. GNHWW. Oh, no, nope, just okay. one W. All right, dot org. All right, <laughs> sorry if I screwed that up. You think that we would know. That's an amazing resource. If you're in this area, there's, I think, well over 700 members right now. Um, but they're a great resource. And there's quite a few New Hampshire Furniture Master members who have been professionals who are involved in the guild. So you go to these meetings sometimes, and you're going to be sitting next to someone who does it professionally, and you can pick their brain about something, or maybe they'll be presenting. 
So you're getting a, a quasi-apprentice experience just there by hanging out. You know that we, one of the guild presentations that we just added to our trip is in East Tennessee, right? One of the ones we're going to? Yeah, the one we were just talking about. Oh, there yeah. is, no, they're in Nashville. Oh, they're in Nashville. Okay, cool. Cumberland so, Furniture. Yeah, so this group's in Nashville, and we're setting up the presentation, and uh, the guy that we're communicating with just said, oh, yeah, it sounds good, and we we're all set. I just want to let Tom know, and some of our members were concerned, you know, that it's going to be interesting for our our group because 85% of our members are professionals. Professional makers. I'm like, what? Pretty good. 85%? That's amazing. Like, so it does make you go, whoa, I better step up my game. <laughs> but I, I just... I want to bore them. No, it's going to be fun because you, you can empathize with their life. I mean, I live that life most of my life. And I also, um, I love the craft. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of different give and take there. It's all good. So yeah. looking forward to that. So just think about joining that group. If you're in Nashville and you want to learn, what would we I would be in that group in a heartbeat because <laughs> you want to be with people who are there. And you're going to find that woodworkers in general, even the professionals, are extremely generous mm -hmm. for the most part. Yes, they are. With, with sharing their techniques and skills. Yeah, and Billy brings up a good question. They, they, it is normal for guilds, from our experience, to require dues, but it's a very reasonable amount. Right. Annually, you Dirt, will find it. Yes. Yeah. And, and you, they do uh, fundraising experiences with people, and you can contribute to that and support them in that way. We, we really, I'm always surprised how, how many people we know that aren't involved in guilds, and it's really... Yeah. And, and I don't know if you're going to mention, are you going to talk about maker spaces as well? Yes. Okay. All right. Good. Sorry. I was going to start going like this. Yes. <laughs> I deserve that. Okay. Keep going. I can't do it, though, so secretly. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, other organizations I just want to throw in there, um, the Society of American Period Furniture Makers, mm -hmm. SAFM. It's a hard one to say. Exactly. But they are across the country, um, not so much in the Northwest, but you can go on their website, sapfm.org, and you can search for a local chapter. If you're into period furniture, like the way I learned furniture making, you want to be in one of those groups. They're, they're amazing, great resource, and check them out. You can go on their website, and learn traditional furniture making. There are lots of other types of organizations. This is another place where you can kick in if you get any ideas. And can I ask, add one more thing? Sure. Just because you're not local to where these guilds are doesn't mean that it wouldn't be valuable for you to be a part because oh, yeah. they have video resources you can access. You can zoom in to these things now. Yep. So they're, they're becoming much more um, accessible. Right, and, and that region. group... Specifically, they have an annual meeting every year down in like Williamsburg or whatever I think it is and bring in great presenters as well. So that's an awesome one to be part of. Um, also, obviously, you can check out all kinds of content on YouTube. It's hit or miss. Mm -hmm. Look, are you hitting right now or are you missing? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you don't know. Hey, it's uh, free. Yeah, you have to trust the people, but as time goes on, I think you kind of gravitate toward people who are more your speed or you enjoy for whatever reason. So um, there are tremendous resources on YouTube as well. Um, online courses, online communities, we've talked a little bit about that already, but um, you can get those kind of things. We like we are offering those online courses. I know Fine Woodworking from time to time does. I'm actually talking to them right now about doing one with them as well. But we are gonna we have these this library of over 20 courses that you can take. And we, do you know when I when I share a course like we're about to start on Tuesday night, I'm like I'm thinking about it just like when I was in Pug Shop. I am you. <laughs> I just, I so empathize with 
the, the joy, the curiosity, um, all the whys to what we're doing, that anyone who's taken a course with me, you know that's how I'm trying to just give you what I'm thinking about as much as the approach and why I'm going this way mm -hmm. and what other methods might be possible. So that's as close, I think, as an apprentice experience gets. When you take a course with us, when you build a piece of furniture with, with anybody, because it really gets you into the, mm -hmm. the deep water on a project. And that's what really stays with you. Um, and then of course, there are woodworking schools. If you want to get official, like I shared earlier, going to someplace like North Bennett, or up here we have in Maine, the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship. There's other small schools. I mean, we are considered a little bit of a school. We have these summer courses coming up. Mm -hmm. I used to do them a few almost every summer. Um, but now that we're on YouTube and whatever, they they sell out faster than they ever used to. So <laughs> that's good. And um, and then you have so you have those in person classes. Now, if you go to some place like North Bennett, it's going to be it's going to be expensive, but it's a fully immersive like two year program. Mm -hmm. But it's just like going to college, really. It's semester based, and then I. Pretty sure the summer's off. Someone can correct me there. You can take evening courses and shorter courses. I know the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship has like three different tracks you can go on. Short courses, uh, a little more immersive, and then the full, full immersive uh, to spend up there. And they've got some good instructors up there as well. But, you know, I love my time with Pug. What was so good about that was it was... I was not just learning the, the making of furniture, I was learning the business of furniture making because it was real. I mean, we had to order our lumber, we had to talk to the customer, they had to come in, we had to visit sites. I mean, it wasn't just academic. So I enjoyed that whole aspect of understanding from the beginning what the whole process is and the way to talk to clients and also to suppliers and all that. So that was one of the benefits of making the move to North Carolina. Um, now, lastly, I know there's probably other things I'm missing. I wanna talk about the, what I started off with. When you might wanna actually have a Pugmore-like experience, an internship somehow with a maker. Now, that's a question that, like I said, I get, but I don't always know how to answer it because I know this, I know what this is like from both sides, okay? I've been the apprentice going in and I've been the maker who's had apprentices, but when I've had apprentices in the past, they weren't technically apprentices. They were paid and they were employed and they took a lot of my time too, like to instruct them how to do, because they were learning. Most, mostly they were, it was like they were learning the process. Um, if I was trying to, if I was to advise anyone to get an apprenticeship, I would say offer to intern with a local maker. That's where I would start. Don't even ask for pay. Just think, it's, if you go to North Bennett Street School, you're gonna spend full days there, day after day, two years. And when you get out, you will have spent, I know it's like at least $60,000. So if you can have some other form of income and maybe just part-time approach someone and say, hey, I will help you out. Um, but it has to be in a way that really helps that maker out. So here's my advice to you. I would find out what that maker needs and what they need most. And I would try to be very likable, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Not that I've had people who are unlikable. I'm just saying, saying, you want to be a lift to that person. You want to feel like you're lightening their load because they're gonna be, trust me, they're gonna feel pressure for what they're trying to work on and get it to the client. They're not gonna to wanna to have long conversations about books. I mean, 
They're going to want to work. So you, have, you would have to go in there being absolutely deferential to them. But um, trust me, you will be a lighter weight. And as time goes on, they're going to go, wow, this person is really good to have around. And maybe you'll get some other kind of job. But no, they'll be, they'll be more free and interested now and then to share with you the processes. But if you're around and you're helping out in small ways like that, that is good for them, then you're going to lighten their load. You know, I don't, need, I don't need help now, like physically, like with the stuff. But sometimes I think, you know what would be cool? Is if someone, and this sounds like I'm, I'm giving a job option, I'm not. I'm just saying, but my, what would lighten my load, if someone was really good at editing and loved editing and wanted to edit videos, but also wanted to be part of what's going on behind the scenes and seeing, and was a real help and a lift and a light weight like that, and wanted to do it as an exchange, that would be fun. That would be cool. But I'm just using that as an exa a personal example. I think every maker out there could use somebody, but that's where it is. Like you have to probably have another job, <laughs> you know, you have to have another source of income, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a, the challenge or have a spouse who can work. <laughs> yeah. I've always had a spouse. Work. <laughs> look, look, she's still working. <laughs> so, um, Anyway, that's, that's all I can say. I don't know who else can advise someone, but it's, it's a kind of a tricky thing because that person isn't into being your teacher. You know, they're, they're in business, they're making furniture, their customers are their clients. They are not able to give you a North Bennett Street experience. If they were, you'd be paying them $30,000 a year, right? And it's not, so that's why I'm saying don't ask for pay. You're going to be in the real world and be, and be as light and as, you know, whatever you agree to be there and do more, be someone that's a joy to have around. That's, that's what I would say. The other option you can do is get into a larger shop. I was talking about single kind of maker, custom furniture maker shops to get into a larger shop. They're going to be probably making the same thing over and over again. And it's going to be more of a production type situation. And that's not going to be as growing or maybe as interesting to you because you're going to probably get put into a place where you're doing something fairly repetitiously, you know, that repetitive work or, uh, and it's just going to feel more like punching the clock and getting in there. If you go in with a single maker, it's going to be more that artistic style. Um, but, you're not going to get paid. <laughs> so, but you're going to learn more at a different rate and you're going to need to contribute to that person as well. I hope that made sense, but that's my two cents for that. Um, otherwise I wouldn't, that's not without using all these other opportunities either. I was doing all these other things while I was with Pug. I was in other organizations. I was <laughs> referencing books and magazines. And a lot of it I had conversations with Pug about because he had a joy and we had a great connection on that. So that's my advice with that. Are there any questions? No questions. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, especially those of you who are trying to dive deeper in the craft. The thing about it is we are all, we're all still apprentices. I, I am so curious and always learning. I mean, I can't wait to visit Newport, Rhode Island and check out the birthplace and the, and the shop area where town, the Townsends and the Goddards were. Uh, I didn't realize how much was still there. So <laughs> thank you for that book and getting me into that. I don't know why I didn't do that earlier. But um, we are, we've, just as a reminder again, if you want to go further and deeper with us with our courses, you can check out Epic Woodworking. Dot com. We've got a new course starting up. Can't wait to get it started. And one of the greatest resources I didn't mention, uh, well, I tried to in the guilds, are the communities out there. We've got an insider community in Epic Woodring called The Neighborhood, and people are sharing amazing content, even like uh, these comments you've seen on the chat tonight. So 
you can become part of the neighborhood. And if you do, you get, an unbel you get access to this course if you're just in the neighborhood. It's an unbelievable deal. And all the other courses we've got, you get discounts on plans and access to the forum, the community of other people who are fired up about it, just yeah, like you. So cool. thank you so much. If you enjoy this content, remember to subscribe, like, and share. And on behalf of the camera lady and myself, look forward to seeing you next time, right back here on Shop Night Live. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. See you next week. Thanks for being here.